ultimately he'll have to, I think, to reset the DGT board. Here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think whether Magnus remembered or the arbiter told him, or he was just leaving it for the for the young fan, you have to reset the DGT board before the clock starts. That's a pro tip. Otherwise, you will debunk the feed and cause Chess.com's tech problems. Don't do it. Oh, <laughs> anyway, that's no, the you, reason. You got it. No, it's uh, it's important. There you go. And now we're off, and he does indeed repeat. So E4 was the plan, best by test, as they say, and E5 immediately on the board from Ferruja. Okay, so interesting start to this game. Ferruja clearly in a solid mood. He's been experimenting with all sorts of uh, Sicilians in recent times, but often when he wants to take big risks. And we see the Roy Lopez, the Spanish opening, Anna. Um, very classical stuff, and the dreaded Berlin. It is the Berlin, oh Berlin, we love you Berlin. Uh, what will Magnus Carlsen do to not go for the Berlin endgame? Because I think he will avoid it, but what are his options? Will he play D3? Mm -hmm. Oh, he no, goes, no, maybe he's, he's not avoiding it. it. Okay. It. Okay, that to me is a surprise. I would have thought that. Well, and we'll definitely talk about that when we get to some analysis, but right now let's back up to the bird's eye view, but I agree, and that's a, that's a really interesting nugget to come back to, and David will let you break down why so many players prefer D3 when they want to avoid the most forcing lines, but maybe Magnus came with, you know, these guys all have a bit of a trick up their sleeve, right? They've still got some novelties in the mid-20s in some of these forcing lines, so I'm not going to say that Magnus did this because he's inviting equal play or wants Armageddon just yet. I think that Magnus might have something he prepared and brought to the table but but all right we look around um some slow starts on some of the other boards we have another tarash looking move order that's an interesting one there between dingley ren and hikaru nakamura um oh and uh just to add to magnus's game it's his turn and he stood up for some reason yeah oh, oh just to get just to get the coat oh, set okay. up he's got to get the death star chair ready before you before you do work, you know, <laughs> you gotta have the intimidating. And then you kneel on your chair because it's more comfortable to think like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the craziest pose we've seen. Many of the, <laughs> the players. Uh, now he's ready. I was gonna say maybe the most interesting uh, start to this, or at least in terms of uh, rarely seen openings at the top level, is Ding Deren against Nakamura because you mentioned it looks like a Tarash, uh, Danny, but temporarily black is a pawn down. Um, he could temporarily could at least uh, for the short term be two pawns down uh, if Ding captures another pawn on this next turn.
obvious to me. Just shuffle the rook back and forth. Um, I, I think what he's thinking about here is whether he should play h6 or not. Um, I mean, I think probably h6 is fine, but I, I would most likely just shuffle rook b7, rook c7. Ah, oh, he does it, okay. I mean, this, you know, it's, there's the famous Levon. I mean, of course, Levon's not the only one to say this, but, you know, when you push pawns forward, they can't go backwards. Um, and I remember, actually, during my time working with Gary as well, Barov, uh, you know, one of the things he said about Magnus is Magnus loves it when someone pushes their pawns forward, just in general, because um, they can't go backwards. So, yeah, I mean, th this should be a draw of perfect play, but, you know, it is Magnus after all, and we, we have a long way to go. Actually, I know what he's going to do. He's going to put the king on h4, go g4, and then he's going to work the king back. Um... Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna eventually put the king on h4, go g4, then work the king back, put the rook like on d5 or something, and try to do something. That's what's gonna happen. Whether that happens in five moves or thirty moves, is is a, is the big question. Okay, but I mean, I would say this should this should be a draw. Um, because I'm struggling to find a situation where Ali Reza has a move that's not obvious. I mean, basically, is to keep the rook on the seventh rank and just shuffle. So because of that, he should be able to build up probably like one to two more minutes on the clock, I would think. Um, yeah, see, so he plays rook c7 right away. And that, that's the thing, is that it's not a situation where Ali Reza's moves are difficult. He has only, he really only has one plan, which is just sit on the seventh rank. So that helps him. Yeah, that, that helps him tremendously here, tremendously. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this, this, this is a draw with correct play, obviously. But, uh, I mean, we have a ways to go, so who knows. Uh, Hikaru, can we get your thoughts on some of the other games? Sure, yeah. I um, mean, there's only one other game, right? Regulation. Look at this. White gets the opposition. Black has to move. And look at Magnus. Magnus feels bad about it. He just shook his head and was like, yeah, it's it's winning now. We'll see this play out on the board, I think, but he's going to have to give way. And there we go. Frucha oh, resigns in shock. He, he knows. He blew it just a moment ago. David, we're gonna need to replay that, but first of all, like, you can see it on, on their faces, obviously, Firuja knows, Magnus knows, that is a basic king and opponent game on their level. Wow. And he stepped into it. Yeah, this is the, uh, the pitfall of playing purely on calculation when you have no time left on the clock. Uh, you've got to be practical sometimes, just avoid rook trades, avoid king and opponent games, they're the most treacherous of all endings. And uh, Magnus doing it second round in a row, grinding out a victory from nothing. By the way, we should probably analyze